Hello everyone, Lord here, and welcome to Shadowverse. As you may or may not know, I love all kinds of strategic games, but there's an especially big spot in my heart for good card games. Shadowverse is one such game. It is a one-on-one -on -one competitive CCG collectible card game, which is made and maintained by Japan-based developer Psy Games. This is not their first foray into the world of gaming, however, and even if you haven't played any of their other titles, you may have actually heard of them, as they sponsor quite a few esports teams, as well as more recently the football team Juventus. In this video, I will cover the basic concepts and systems that comprise the game, as well as explain how to actually play it. If you've already had some experience with other card games, for example the ever so popular Hearthstone, a lot of the implementations here should feel immediately familiar and easy to understand. If not, fear not, for Shadowverse does an excellent job of actually explaining all of its nestled effects and keywords in a simple, easy to understand manner. As this introduction will pretty exhaustively look at all elements of the game including menus, card breakdowns and such, please use the navigation in the video description if you'd like to skip to a specific segment. Without further ado, let's dive straight in. Welcome to the main menu! Remind you of something? If you thought mobile game, you would actually be correct. When this initially launched in June 2016, Shadowverse was a mobile-only game. It has since received a PC version on the Steam platform, however a lot of its UI elements retain that mobile feel. Though this is mostly a visual quirk, as the controls and performance of this port are nothing short of excellent. Now let's quickly go through all of these interface elements and buttons one by one. In the top left is you. Your profile picture, name, rank and points will be displayed here. Below that, we have a scrolling window containing the most important news, updates, and promotions as decided by the game developer. You can click on them to get more detailed information. In the middle, we have an interactable preview of, I believe, the last deck you played with. You can look at and move the cards as well as view their evolved state, something we will talk more about later. In the top right are your currencies, rupees, or gold as I like to call it represents the normal currency that you can earn through in-game actions, and crystals represent the premium currency that you can buy with real money. The plus button here is just a shortcut to the crystal shop. The crate is where you usually collect rewards earned through various in-game actions, promotions, and even free stuff side games quite frequently gives out. It's obviously empty on my account, however if there's ever anything in it you will see a red number next to it, much like a Facebook notification, that indicates goodies are waiting for you. Do note that this should be your first stop after completing the tutorial as a new player since this is how you get your starting out packs. The info button leads you to a page that gives a very detailed list of recent news. On mobile devices this will open inside the app, however on PC it uses your browser to load. The missions button is where you can see your missions which are basically quests, achievements which can be completed for a reward, or the score reward screen that shows what you can earn by playing in ranked mode. We'll talk more about how the ranked system works later on. The friends button unsurprisingly opens up your friend list and allows you to add or remove people from it as well as see the current rank and cosmetic profile elements of your friends. Moving on to the bottom, the home button is pretty self-explanatory and simply returns you to the main menu. In other words, this interface, which allows you to access all the other buttons. Think of this screen as your navigational hub. The solo button leads to the PvE, that is to say player versus environment, playing against an AI rather than another actual person, portion of the game. From here you can either play through the main story or practice against bots of multiple different difficulties. I will mention that I recommend playing through the main story and all of the higher end difficulties of the practice opponents as both provide varying degrees of one-time rewards which can quite significantly help you to build your collection. The multi button leads to the PvP player versus player, component of the game. This is where you will likely spend most of your time later on. You have the option of choosing to play either an unranked match, a ranked match or a private match, all of which should be pretty self-explanatory. I will add that while unranked matches are often a great place to test new decks with no fear of losing ranked points or completing daily quests, keep in mind that your unranked matchmaking will still be based on your rank, so don't expect to either stomp or get stomped. 
games are usually pretty well balanced. The Arena button leads to this game's variant of a draft format, that is to say a mode where you build your deck from a bunch of semi-random cards the game offers you and play against others who have done the same. It is worth noting that this is strictly a PvP game mode in contrast to some other games which offer a PvE variant of this. The name Take Two comes from the fact that unlike typical drafts, where you pick a single card out of usually three choices, here you pick from two buckets consisting of two cards each. This typically leads to some interesting decision making as very powerful cards are often paired with very weak ones. The cards button leads you to both your deck builder and collection respectively. Needless to say you will be spending a lot of time either looking through what cards you have or arranging them into a deck with which to play, so we will come back to explore this screen in more detail later on. The shop button leads you to, unsurprisingly, the shop. This is where you can purchase cards, pre-built decks, sleeves, and even alternate leaders. Let's go through your options here. Crystals, as I mentioned, are the premium currency of this game. You can use them to purchase basically anything you can also purchase with gold. That said, there are certain items only purchasable with crystals, such as pre-built decks and some promotional cosmetics. I won't get too much into how the game's economy works, but I will mention that I strongly recommend taking advantage of special offers if you decide to spend money on the game, as the regular price of crystals is somewhat high, at least in my region. Buying cards is an integral part of any CCG, and here we have two options. Either buying packs, which is what you will be spending the majority of your resources doing, or buying pre-built decks. Let's take a look. Whoa, that's a lot of buttons. Don't worry, we'll break it all down. Uh, starting from the top left, these buttons allow you to switch your view between rotation and unlimited card packs. Shadowverse, like many other card games, is divided between two formats of play, rotation and unlimited. Rotation, much akin to the other game's standard formats, allows you to only include cards from a specific number of card sets, starting with the latest one. That is to say, older cards eventually rotate out and are no longer legal in this format. Unlimited, as the name implies, is the opposite and allows you to play with all card sets that have been released from the latest to the very first one. This button simply allows you to switch between looking at card sets Lego in both Rotation and Unlimited and those that are exclusively usable in Unlimited. This is mostly to prevent newer players from accidentally spending all of their currency on cards they may not be able to use. Below that we see the set selector, here we can choose which set or collection of cards we'd like to purchase. As you can see, the little window shows us a preview of some of the more exciting things we can find if we open packs of this set. If you'd like to know exactly what's in each of these sets and what the chances of attaining a specific card are, you can use the handy little details button over here or visit one of the numerous community sites. Okay, final part. The buttons on this side of the screen allow us to actually purchase packs from the set we have selected. As you can see, we have three options. Tickets, which are basically vouchers. Rupees, or gold as I like to call it, and crystals. The prices stated are static and pretty self-explanatory with the exception of crystals which allow you to purchase one pack every day at half price. Provided you have the patience and restraint required, slowly using up your crystals on this daily deal is the most cost efficient way to acquire cards from a specific set. Going back, we have the ever so vague buy supplies button. Here we can find three types of purely cosmetic items. Sleeves, leaders, and items. The first two should be pretty self-explanatory, and the third option, items, allows us to acquire Seer's Globes, which can be consumed to convert normal cars to their premium, foil, animated, or what have you, versions at a one-for-one -one exchange rate. It is worth noting that these are bought with vials, which are your dust, or card crafting currency, at a pretty crazy high price, with the exception of a one-time discount for your very first Seer's Orb. Unless you are spending loads of real money on the game or just have to have that one particular premium card, I strongly advise staying away from Sears Globes. As for leaders and sleeves, it bears mention that some of these cosmetic items can either be purchased for gold, in the case of the initial set of alternative leaders, or are straight up free, in the case of the first two sets of promotional sleeves, so you may want to give them a look if you care about cosmetics. Finally, the more button gives you access to basically every other kind of button you may need, changing the game's language, accessing replays, contacting side games, or just tweaking your settings. 
It is worth noting that most of your cosmetic customization is done from the profile menu, however that can be also accessed from the home screen or any other screen by clicking on your portrait, like so. While most of the buttons here are very self-explanatory, I will mention that changing your leader, provided you've acquired more than one, is done by pressing on a specific craft and pressing the change button, like so. Right, now that we feel more at home with the menu, how about we talk about some cards. In Shadowverse, you will be using three types of cards to defeat your opponents. Spell cards, follower cards, and amulet cards. Spell cards are expendable cards which, when paid for, provide a one-time effect and are removed from your hand. Followers are what you will typically use to either defend yourself or fight the opponent with. When paid for, followers enter the battlefield and can be used until they die or are removed by another effect. Amulets are like followers that cannot fight. They also enter the battlefield and typically provide a multi-turn effect, however, the nature of that effect varies drastically between amulets, with some of them simply being an endless passive buff and others only sitting on the board for a specified number of turns. How about those numbers? All cards, regardless of type, have a cost in PP, play points, or this game's equivalent of mana, in the upper left corner. This is the amount of resources you have to expend in order to play the card. In addition, followers have two more numbers, an attack value, as indicated by the blue sword, and a defense, or health, value, as indicated by the red shield. These stats are relevant in combat. In addition, all followers have a base and an evolved state, with their evolved state almost always being significantly better than their base state. The evolution mechanic is an integral part of Shadowverse's gameplay and we will talk in significant detail about it later. However, for the time being, just keep in mind that evolution points are a very precious resource, so very few and very select followers will ever be flipped into their evolved state. While we are browsing cards in a CCG, let's quickly see how the different rarities look like. We have Bronze, Silver, Gold and Legendary all of which should sound pretty familiar if you've played any other digital card game recently. As a quick note, I will mention that unlike other games, card rarity has no impact on how many copies of a card you can have in your deck. Just like you can play 3 copies of a specific bronze, you can also play 3 copies of a specific legendary. So now that we know what cards look like, how about we actually talk about the rules of the game. I will be using some in-game screenshots to help with the explanations, and while these may look daunting at first, I will be breaking down every element of what you see, just like I did for the menu, so don't panic. Alright. As I mentioned at the start, Shadowverse is a one-on-one, -on -one, best of one competitive card game. Your objective is to reduce your opponent's health from 20 to 0, while keeping yours above 0. Alternatively, if your opponent runs out of cards and has to draw, he will immediately be killed by the Reaper. There are no 30 minute fatigue matches here. The playing field is divided roughly in half with the bottom part belonging to you and the top part belonging to your opponent. The main middle part of the board is the space where followers and amulets will enter once they are played. Do note that only 5 entities in any combination of followers and amulets may be in play for each player. So while those passive effect amulets may look good, keep in mind that they will reduce the space you have for fielding your fighters. Each player is personified by an avatar or leader signifying their faction. Factions in Shadowverse are called crafts and there is a total of 8. Forestcraft, Swordcraft, Runecraft, Dragoncraft, Shadowcraft, Bloodcraft, Havencraft and Portalcraft. Each of these crafts has a unique inbuilt mechanic as well as a plethora of faction specific cards. In addition, each craft has multiple available avatars you can choose from, however, these are purely cosmetic. For this example, I will be playing as Dragoncraft with the avatar Dark Dragoon Forte, facing off against Bloodcraft represented by the vampire Urias Formon. Each player's health total is signified by the number and the red shield next to their avatar. To the side of each avatar, you will also find the evolution mechanic interface with an orb featuring a number inside of it and tiny crystals above it. The number signifies how many additional turns must pass until that player is able to use the evolution mechanic. 
The crystals signify how many evolution points that player possesses. Each evolution costs one point and only one evolution can be performed per turn. Once evolutions become unlocked, the orb itself will either glow yellow or be dimmed, signifying if that player can use an evolution this turn. The crystals will also dim as evolution points are expended. Each player's PP, play points or mana if you prefer, can be found in a little green box, with yours being in the right side of the screen and your opponent's being on the left side of his avatar. Each player's hand of cards can be found in the corners of the screen, with your cards in the bottom right and your opponent's in the top left. Once you have sufficient play points to play a card from your hand, it will start glowing with a bluish outline. Alternatively, if you have also met a requirement for a secondary effect of a card in your hand, it will glow with a yellowish outline. Each craft's special mechanic indicator is shown in the corners of the screen, with yours in the bottom left and your opponent's in the top right. Some of these are passive indicators and others are interactable buttons. In this example, Dragoncraft's mechanic, Overflow, activates once I reach 7 play points. As such, it has an indicator showing that it is not currently active and that it will take 6 more play points in order to activate it. On the opposite side of the board, Bloodcraft's mechanic, Vengeance, activates once my opponent's health drops to 10. Currently, it shows that it is not active and would require 10 points of damage to be dealt to his health in order to activate. In addition, below or above that indicator, you will find a small information box which shows the number of shadows, number of cards in deck, and number of cards in hand, respectively, for that player. This extended interface, however, is only visible on the PC version. In order to see yours or your opponent's deck size in the mobile version, you will need to hold your finger over the respective player's deck. To the left of the screen, you can find the Action History button, which shows a list of the last couple of things that happened. Very useful if a bunch of effects just activated at the same time and left you confused. In the top left of the screen, you will find the Options button, which allows you to see your opponent's rank, concede, or simply tweak gameplay or graphical settings mid-game. Finally, to the right of the screen, you can see the End Turn button, which, as the name suggests, allows you to end your turn and your opponent to take theirs. You may have noticed some cards in play on the previous slides, although we will talk more about these while in actual play, I will quickly mention what they were. The one here is an evolved follower on the opponent's side of the board. The little horns at the top signify that this follower is evolved. The red number in her defense slot shows that she is wounded and currently under her maximum health. The little green flag means that she has an effect, which repeatedly activates under a certain condition. The one here is an amulet. It also has a repeatable effect, and the number in the bottom right signifies its countdown, a unique mechanic which basically means the amulet will destroy itself without outside intervention in that many turns. Right, now that we're used to the look of the game board, how about we play a full-on game? Let's jump into practice mode and fight it out with Urias. As a low difficulty will reduce the opponent's health total and possibly make the game trivially easy, let's play against a moderately difficult bot. Right, as you can see, we're facing an expert opponent. This is about the equivalent of uh, an average-ish bot. So we are going second, as you can see by the indicator over here, and this is the mulligan phase. We did not actually see this in the slides because it only occurs once per game and it is before the game starts. Shadowverse uses a very similar system to most other card games which is known as the partial Paris system in which you just choose which cards you want to get rid of and uh, you get the same amount of cards from your deck. So we are basically looking for early game cards that we can play. So we'll keep this to play point amulet in our hand and we'll throw back the rest. Okay, so as I mentioned previously, we are playing Dragoncraft. Dragoncraft's main strategy is to Accept ramp up, uh, that is to say, gain extra play points before the opponent and take advantage of playing higher play point costing cards before the opponent has access to cards of a similar caliber themselves. So we already know where the play point counters are. So I have one play point, my opponent has one play point. 
evolutions are not activated and we both have 20 health. So all the cards in my hand currently cost more than one, so nothing is highlighted, I cannot play anything. And you might notice the way to play cards is to actually focus in on your hand by clicking on it. it just brings it brings it up front, more into view, and uh, this is the way you kind of play cards. So we can't play anything, so we'll just pass the turn to our opponent. Right, so you can see effects which were played on the left and right side of the screen. On the left will be our effects, on the right will be the opponent's effects. Uh, you might have noticed that card he played popping up right over here. So we can use the battle log to see what it was. So he played a two play point card, uh, a spell card, which is a one time use card, which said deal two damage to your leader and draw two cards. As I mentioned previously, Bloodcraft's main mechanic, Vengeance, activates when the health of the leader is at 10 or lower so he is using this card to lower his health to actually activate vengeance and also gaining the benefit of drawing two cards so now that it is our second turn we can actually play some cards we have the option of playing either this dragon summoner the staircase to paradise or this dragon oracle so i won't go too into depth on what each of these cards does but basically dragon summoner draws us cards staircase to paradise eventually draws us cards and Dragon Oracle gives us extra play points. So this is a typical Wild Growth-esque effect. Gain an empty play point orb, and it has a benefit if we're already at seven or more play points. So we're just gonna play that. And as you can see, our play points increase by one. So next turn, instead of having three play points, we're going to have four. Okay, so our opponent has played a creature or a follower, as it is known in this game. It is a three play point follower, has two attack, and has, it has three health. It is a bloodcraft only follower, and it has the effect fanfare, gain plus one plus zero, and ward if vengeance is active for you. So there's gonna be a lot of these keywords in the game, but as I mentioned, Shadowverse does a really good job of actually explaining what each of these keywords does. You can simply click on basically anything that is bolded, and this little helpful explanation screen will pop up and tell you exactly what that means. So fanfare, effects activate when you play the card from your hand using play points. So enters play or rather um, battle cry. There's lots of similar effects in other card games. Ward, this is basically taunt. You have to attack a ward follower before you can attack the opponent themselves. And vengeance is the mechanic I talked about previously where the opponent has to be at 10 health or lower. So let's parse this effect really quickly. When this card comes into play, so fanfare, it gains one attack and ward, so it becomes a 3-3 ward if vengeance is active for the opponent. So as it was not currently active, as he's on 18 health rather than 10, this comes in as just a 2-3 vanilla follower. So as other card games, followers cannot attack on the same turn they are played, so he was not able to attack me. However, he will be able to do so next turn, so we have the choice here of either playing something to um kind of contest the board or just trying to advance our own game plan so in this case what we're going to do is we're going to remove this follower from the board because we don't really have a much better play we're going to play breath of the salamander which is a spell card it deals three damage to an enemy follower or enhance six it deals two to all enemy followers so enhance is another mechanic it basically means that you can overpay for the card to get a additional or stronger effect Enhance, by the way, is not optional. If you have enough play points to pay the enhance, the card will always be on the enhanced side. So that's kind of a problem with some cards. Anyway, the point is we don't actually need the enhance effect this card. We just want to pay two and deal three damage to an enemy follower. So this is like the selection interface. We just click on this guy and boom, he's dead. The other card we're going to play is Staircase to Paradise. Now, this has a lot of text and is actually a quite complicated card, but basically this is a uh, amulet it has a countdown of six as i mentioned countdown is a mechanic where the amulet will destroy itself eventually so at the beginning of your turn countdown amulets will reduce their countdown by one if they're on the board and when their countdown reaches zero they will destroy themselves as it says right here so this card has a countdown of six so it'll take six turns to activate it also has the additional effect whenever an allied follower is destroyed, subtract one from this amulet's countdown. So it has kind of a mechanic that will allow it to be destroyed in less than six turns. 
and its effect when it is, it is destroyed, that is the last words effect, it's basically death rattle if you want to call it that, uh, it says that at the start of your next turn, uh, put three random followers from your deck into your hand. So it is basically card draw. It is going to draw three followers from our deck and put them into our hand. It also has an enhance effect. We can pay five instead of two to subtract six from this amulet's countdown, basically making it destroy itself immediately. So it, it'll kind of function like a spell card in that case. But we're just going to pay two. It'll come into play. And you can see here the little indicator that it'll take six turns for it to destroy itself. Also, these flashing icons, we already talked about the green flag. The green flag means there's a repeatable effect. That will be the effect that uh, subtracts countdown when a follower is destroyed. And the little skull means there is a last words effect. So something will happen when this card dies. A lot of amulets have last words effects and a lot of amulets have countdown. Though some are just basic um, passive effects which stay on the board. Anyway, let's pass to our opponent. Isn't demonic armor lovely? Right. They played another follower, so it is a uh, 4 play point 3 four, 4 follower, uh, which has an evolve effect. So these are effects which trigger only when a card is evolved. We actually got evolutions unlocked this turn. As you can see, my evolution ball is um, lighted up. So I will be showing that off this or next turn perhaps. But the point is that this card has a special effect which only activates when it is evolved. So when it is evolved, it will deal 2 damage to an enemy follower and restore 2 defense to your leader. So a lot of crafts actually have these kind of mid-game-esque cards which have very strong evolve effects and these cards are mainly used to contest the board in the mid-game and uh, make very efficient use of your evolution points. So sadly in this case we don't really have anything super worthwhile we can play to evolve uh, so the only follower we can play is the Dragon Summoner. Uh, as you can see, this is the normal side of the Dragon Summoner, and the bottom part, which has evolved, is the evolved state. So it can evolve into a 3-4. Sadly, that is not enough to destroy the enemy's 3-4, obviously, because it has 4 health and our guy only has 3 attack. So we will not be doing an evolution this turn. Instead, we will play our spell card called Draconic Fervor. We will gain an empty play point and draw 2 cards, as well as restore 3 defense, even though we're at full health, so it'll kind of be wasted, but... The point here is we kind of want to gain play points to uh, reach the end game quicker. So as you notice, we're at six play points and our opponent is at four. Okay, so our opponent has unlocked evolutions, as you can see by the text. He's not going to take advantage of them. Evolutions are typically used to contest the board. They are not so commonly used to increase um, face damage, if you will. Right, in this case, we again don't have um, super many very good plays. So what I'm going to do here is actually just offensively uh, use one of my endgame cards. Uh, it is Dark Dragoon Forte. So this is a 6 mana, 5, 1 follower. So it has 5 attack, 1 health. It has Storm. Storm is basically the ability to attack on the same turn uh, that the card is played. This is um, haste, if you will. And it says that this fo follower cannot be attacked if Overflow is active for you. As we can see, Overflow is active because we're at 7 play points. So basically this is a um, follower whose objective is to come on the board and start offensively and very aggressively uh, dropping your opponent's health down towards zero. And uh, the main way it protects itself is by you being in overflow and uh, you know disabling the ability to be attacked. However, it still has very low health but very high attack for its mana cost. So we're going to play Dark Dragoon Forte. Right, some of these legendaries have special animations when they come into play. Anyway, and we're actually going to evolve Dark Dragoon Forte to increase her stats and maximize the damage we can do. So there are two ways you can evolve. You can either click on the card and click evolve, or you can drag from the little orb here. So what happens when you evolve? The card, the card gets turned to its other side. It gets an increase in stats. Usually it is plus two attack and plus two health, although that differs wildly between cards. If there's an evolve effect that triggers, this card does not have an evolve effect and there is no additional effect on its evolved side. Our evolution for the turn is used. As I mentioned previously, we can only use one evolution per turn, same for our opponent. And as you can see, one evolution crystal has been expended. An additional effect for evolved cards is that they gain rush, which is a keyword allowing them to attack immediately. However, they can only attack opponent's followers. So if this card could not attack 
previously I would be able to attack my opponent's followers. However, since it already has Storm, that effect of giving it Rush basically did nothing. So we're just going to attack our opponent directly. Alright, and we're just going to pass the turn. So these cards over here, Blazing Breath, that were lit up, they deal 2 damage to an enemy follower. They are not super useful right now, which is the reason I did not play them. Right. So our opponent played a uh, removal card, which just destroyed our Dark Dragoon Forte. As I mentioned, she is very easy to kill. All right. Blood Rage, deal 3 damage to an enemy follower. 6 instead of Vengeance is active, as we can still see Vengeance is not active. Anyway, so we're getting kind of in trouble. We're also at 11, but he has the uh, overwhelming board advantage here. So we're going to have to do something to try to take back the board, if you will. So we're going to play um, Dragon Oracle to try to draw into something that will help us out here. That's not really super helpful. All right. Well, we are going to play it nonetheless, I believe. Um, well, actually, we'll play in yellow. So... This girl here, she just has the effect, last words, get an empty play point orb. So, we're going to evolve her. As you notice, she could not attack previously when I played her. Now that I evolved her, she has gained Rush, which is this kind of yellow outline, which means that she can attack other followers, but she cannot attack the opponent, as you can notice by that very clear can't attack text. All right, so we're just going to use her to kill off one of these three fours, which are threatening us. And additionally, we're going to play a Dragon Summoner. It's going to draw us a card. Very useful card. And we're going to use one of these Blazing Breaths to kill this 2-2 right here. So our opponent's turn should be pretty clear here. He can do a lot of damage to us, but let's see what he uh, opts to do. Yep, he is going for the very offensive play. Um, sadly for him, he actually very much underestimated how much damage I could do from my hand. So he opted to use the Wardrobe Raider's Evolve effect to um, deal damage to the Dragon Summoner, killing it and healing himself for two hit points. However, he decided to ignore the Ayala Dragon Knight, uh, first off, not to give me an empty play point orb, though that would be irrelevant at this point because 10 is the maximum you can have, so it wouldn't have mattered if he killed it. However, he went for the direct damage in the hopes of presenting me with a board which, unless answered, uh, immediately kills me. However, since I'm at 10 play points, I can play any card in my hand, and one of the cards I do have in my hand is this Genesis Dragon right here. So Genesis Dragon, it's just a fat, hasty body basically, it's a 10 mana 7, 8, so these are Typically very bad stats, um, a good card in Shadowverse, uh, you're looking at, at stats which are similar to the price point. So a 4 mana 4-4 four, four, or 5 mana 5-5 five, five would be typically a good card. So most cards would be like a 5 mana 4-5 or something of the sort. So these are very bad stats. However, it has the Storm keyword which allows it to attack immediately, which is why its stats are so bad. So we're just going to play the Genesis Dragon. We're going to evolve it. And as you might have very quickly noticed, we have lethal on the board. So the Ayala, which did not get killed, can obviously attack everywhere this turn, since she was not played this turn. And the Genesis Dragon, which has Storm, can attack immediately as well. So our opponent is very much dead. Indeed. Right, a couple of things which I did not mention, but you may have noticed. Number one, the first player handicap. As with most card games, who goes first and second is determined randomly. So, as usual, the second player usually receives some benefits in order to be able to compete with the first player's innate advantage of being able to play, well, first. In Shadowverse, that handicap comes in the form of the second player drawing an extra card in the first turn, getting an extra evolution crystal, and being able to evolve first, as early as turn 4 as opposed to turn 5 for the first player. Despite this seemingly overwhelming number of extra resources, going first has, for the longest time, been the preferred approach for a lot of Shadowverse decks. Number 2. 
Shadows. You may remember me mentioning shadows in the slides and may have noticed the little skull symbol in the info box ticking up. Shadows, to put it very simply, are the number of cards that have been expended or destroyed over the course of the game. While this may seem similar to a graveyard type of counter, do note that entities created by other cards, tokens if you will, also count towards shadows when destroyed even though they themselves are not actual cards. Put simply, if you had one of your followers die, you gain a shadow. If you played a spell card, you gain a shadow. If an amulet you have got destroyed, you gain a shadow. So on and so forth. There's a bit of nuance to the system, but unless you're playing the appropriately named Shadowcraft, which actively manipulates and takes advantage of the resource, it is not something you need to pay too close attention to. Okay, with all that in mind, let's summarize the game's main points. This section also serves as a TLDR for those who are already experienced with other card games and just want the overarching rule set. Number one, you and your opponent both start with 20 life. You cannot go over your starting life total and dropping to zero is the main game ending condition. Number two, the game's main resource is play points. Each card has a cost in PP and you gain one additional play point at the start of your turn as well as refill your PP to the new current maximum. You cannot exceed 10 play points at any time. Number three, decks are comprised of 40 cards total with up to three copies of any one card. You draw one card per turn and attempting to draw from an empty deck results in an immediate game over. Number four, followers, this game's equivalent of creatures, cannot attack on the same turn they are played. This is known as summoning sickness. Number five, Followers can attack both the opponent and other followers. Number six, followers do not regain lost defense, this game is equivalent of health, by themselves and getting their defense to zero destroys them. Number seven, you cannot have more than five entities, that is followers plus amulets combined, on your side of the board. Number eight, evolution the game's signature mechanic can only be used after a specified round in the game, only once per turn, and only a certain amount of times per game. Evolved followers flip to their other side, gaining stats or effects, and gaining the ability to attack other followers this turn, even if they were just played. Number 9. There is no turn sequence. You may attack and play cards in any order. Number 10. The first player handicap is that the second player draws an extra card on the first turn, has an extra evolution crystal, and unlocks the use of evolutions first. Number 11, all game specific keywords, that is bolded words in text, can be clicked in order to get additional information about them. Right, before we end things, allow me to answer some common questions, an FAQ, if you will. How viable is the game for a true free-to-play player? Or how easy is it to have a top-tier deck? The short answer? Very. <laughs> the long answer? Shadowverse is somewhat renowned for having a very free-to-play friendly approach as part of its business model. Not only is the daily intake of currency via login rewards and quests quite significant, with certain quests rewarding whole packs, but there is also a multitude of one-time achievements which offer very large rewards, and a repeatable rank reward system which resets every month. This is all in addition to the fact that new players receive a large lump sum of pack tickets to help them start out. This number varies depending on when you sign up, but new players have been known to receive from 40 to 60 packs just for completing the tutorial. With all that in mind, and considering the presence of the crafting system, it is almost trivial to create a top tier deck from the get-go, provided you either get a little lucky on your pulls, or are fine with dusting a few cards. How popular is the game? Short answer? Very. Long answer. While the public doesn't usually have access to super up-to-date financial data on companies, it's pretty safe to say that Shadowverse is in the top 3 or even top 2 biggest digital card games worldwide. It has held the number 1 spot in Japan basically since its inception, and the only reason it is not at the very top worldwide is the very common for Asian titles slow integration within the western market. 
Needless to say, whether you're looking to get into the tournament scene or just hate having to wait a long time to find opponents, you need not worry, for Shadowverse has plenty of players. How balanced is the game? Short answer, very, though there will always be rumbling. Long answer, unsurprisingly there are actually a lot of conflicting opinions here, so I will try to be as clear as possible. Just like every other competitive centric game, there are periods of imbalance. However, I feel that Shadowverse is a very good example of a rebalancing system done right. The way it works is that there is a date set around the end of each month. On that date, the developer provides a pretty detailed post outlining trends, examining metrics, and providing a comment on public perception. What follows is one of two things. Either cards are adjusted, and there is a short explanation based on the reasoning, or they are not and there is a short explanation as to why particular hot topic cards were not touched. Obviously, cards that are nerfed are able to be dusted for full value until the next month's balance review. Again, people will always find ways to complain about something. However, personally, I really enjoy getting this somewhat frequent glimpse into the developer's thought process and the numbers behind the meta. I feel that most, if not all, rebalancing done up to this point has been done so with finesse and understanding. Unless something was obviously broken, I don't believe there have been many cases of cards just being nerfed to the ground or reduced in power to the point of completely destroying their associated archetype. How easy it is it to ladder or reach a high rank? Short answer, very, though it does take a while. Long answer, Shadowverse utilizes somewhat unusual ranking system that, before reaching masters, includes a letter and a number. I won't get too much into it, but the gist of it is that you could first rank up your number, ranging from 0 to 3, and after reaching the end of rank 3, you play advancement matches to go to the next letter at number 0. So D0, D1, D2, D3, C0, C1, and so on. You can't D rank a letter, so once you get into, for example, C rank, you can no longer go back to D rank. As I said, the system takes a bit to understand, so I'll probably make a separate video about it. However, the important point is that unlike many other games, while your rank rewards reset at the end of the month, your rank does not. So wherever you ended last season is where you will continue from in this one. As such, you very rarely face veteran players in the lower ranks and can somewhat quickly advance to a point where you are playing against people of a similar skill level. Also, there is less pressure to spam ranked games before a certain season ends, just so you can get into a particular rewards bracket. Well, that is until you get the Grandmasters anyway. What is the right craft for me, or what is a good slash the best deck right now? Short answer, no idea. Long answer, I don't think anybody actually expected me to give a straight answer here. If you listen to what I said about the game's balance, you should understand that it's very hard to name the best deck at any point in time. There will always be tier 1 decks, however, the meta is almost always diverse, so what is good right now strongly depends on whether you're playing ranked or in a tournament, what rank you are, what you're most commonly facing, or what playstyle you're most comfortable with. Uh, that said, if you're just looking for a craft to start out with, I recommend either reading the short descriptions given for each craft in the game, or if you want more information, checking one of the very detailed craft breakdowns which are usually found in, in the new player guides of the various community websites. Most crafts tend to lean towards a particular playstyle, for example sword is most commonly associated with aggro, however many of them can be quite flexible so just go with what you like if you're not going to min-max. If I decide to spend money on the game, what is the most efficient way to do so? Short answer, varies. Long answer, varies. There will be a very different answer to this question depending on when you are looking to do this. Usually it's a pretty safe bet to either spend on the daily deal or purchase pre-built decks which have cards that were recently nerfed in order to dust them for full value. However, I recommend checking some of the community websites for a better time-specific approach. Also, as I mentioned previously, if you're going to be spending money, I strongly recommend taking advantage of the various one-time or holiday-centric crystal discounts as the base price of crystals is somewhat high. Where can I find more in-depth information about the meta, top decks, or just general discussion about the game? Short and long answer, the websites I have personally found the most useful when it comes to Shadowverse are as follows. GameAI.jp, if you know Japanese or can wield Google Translate, 
Game AI can supply you with a lot of useful information and is one of the first places that decks from top Japanese players end up being posted with a write-up. Shadowverse.gamepress.gg A great English resource for Shadowverse, Gamepress mostly features translations from Game AI, however they also host a significant number of community decks. sv.bagoom.com Another great English resource for the game. This is my go-to stop for tournament data and resources like card images, voice files and such. It also has some additional features like deck simulation and meta analyzing which are not really available anywhere else. So if you're looking for that one deck that recently placed at the top of a big tournament or need a cropped out image of a character for a spicy meme, Bagoom is the place you should check first. Bonus points for having a very aesthetically pleasing website design. Reddit.com slash r slash Shadowverse, the main English speaking community discussion hub. Unless you've been living under a rock, I assume you are already intricately familiar with what Reddit is, so I'll spare the details there. However, I will mention that this particular subreddit is an actual treasure trove of good information, links to various other useful resources, and of course, balance change memes. Whether you're looking for people to help complete your private match achievement, want to check the latest news, or just want to discuss your favorite waifu, r slash Shadowverse is probably the place to go. Bonus points for having one of the best and most dedicated moderators I've ever seen. You know who you are. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Shadowverse in a pretty sizable nutshell. Assuming you paid attention, you should now know everything you need in order to begin playing one of the world's biggest and most successful digital card games. If you want to see more, please stay tuned as I explore tournament data, popular meta decks and the ranked system in my upcoming continued coverage of Cygames' fantastic entry into the CCG genre. But for now, I have been Lord, and this has been Shadowverse. Thank you for watching.